The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of this broadcast or podcast without the express written consent of Spaced Out Radio or Spaced Out Radio Limited is strictly prohibited. Listener discretion is advised. of British Columbia to you listening around the world. This is Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. They let us play with all our toys. They let us think that we're big boys. They let us make a lot of noise while we're in the world. They let us think we're Superman. You can follow us on our website, spacedoutradio.com, on iTunes and tune in. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. On Facebook at Spaced Out Radio Show, or on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Are you playing with Bigfoot and aliens again? Uh, Dad, you gotta stop haunting the goat. It's scaring them. All right, seriously, put down the pointy sticks. Okay! Game on! Game on! Game on! <laughs> The password is... All right, all right, all right. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride on Spaced Out Radio. Mr. Bumblefoot, Dave is ready for liftoff. Seriously, Dave? Really? Aren't you a little old for a tinfoil hat? I am. Toby! Bye bye! Yes, you! Bye bye! Get this, please take your seat of our host. We're with you Start. Two. One. Boost the ignition. And lift off. Good evening and welcome to Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, and it's good to have you along for the ride on this Tuesday, May 2nd, 
Wednesday, May 3rd, if you're on the East Coast. Hope you're enjoying a great day and night, especially with all the hockey fights going on in the NHL playoffs. We are live right here in the Uncle Jimbo's cabin, right here in the Great White North, as we are here seven days a week. We welcome in everyone listening in on our terrestrial stations, WQEE 99, Rock the Key, down in Noonan, Georgia, home of the Walking Dead. We are also live on the United Public Radio Network. On 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. We're live on spacedoutradio.com, on Spreaker, KTLK, The Fringe FM, Renegade Talk Radio out of Las Vegas, the High Plains Talk Radio Network, and on Revolution Radio. Remember, the Double R Machine is a donation station funded by you, the valued listener. Head on over to freedomslips.com and donate today. Like our music, then rock with us to Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns and Roses, currently of Art of Anarchy. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, follow me at Dave Scott, S O R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune us in on TuneIn. Download our shows from iTunes. We're also on RadioGuide.fm, TalkStream Live, Player.fm, and Stitcher. And our website is SpacedOutRadio.com. And if you head over to Patreon.com for as low as a dollar a month, you can become a patron of SOR. Now, if you want to take part in this show, you got to do it online. Visit one of our chat rooms. Click on Listen Live on our website. You'll go right to our chat room. If you're on Revolution Radio, on Spreaker, on the UPRN chat room, or a valued member on Facebook of the SOR Space Travelers Club, make sure you put your questions in capital letters. Or if you're on Twitter, like Robert, like Eric, like Deb, like God of Thunder, like Les, make sure you use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio to connect with me live during the show. If you head with to our website for five bucks a month, you can become an SOR space traveler. Our news section called The Encounter Online has some great stories put together by our team of writers, led by editors Eric Markham and Everett Themer. You can check out my latest blog there as well. And if you've had a sighting that you can't explain, fill out an SOR sight lines report. We'll send somebody to check it out for you. Tonight, we step back into the forests of North America where the creatures we all know share space with the animals we don't. Across our continent, from First Nations legends and lore to sightings from hikers, hunters, campers, and more, we continually have reports of strange creatures being seen and sighted. Reports of Sasquatch, Dogman, Little People, and other phenomena scattered across the lands and forests and waterways. What exactly are people seeing? And the tougher question, how many eyewitness reports never get filed? Look, when it comes to talking about such subjects, there's a lot of fear that goes along with it, from ridicule from friends and co-workers, to not wanting to believe what was seen due to personal or religious beliefs. For whatever reason, people, like you and me, have a tough time discussing these topics at times. Since childhood... Our guest tonight has been studying the strange outdoors. Donald Young Jr. was taught at a young age to respect nature and all the secrets it has to offer. Growing up with American Indian heritage led him to the fascinating legends of his family, which eventually led him to researching and writing the book Trail of the Sasquatch, A Shaman's Journey. And on that note, we bring Donald B. Young Jr. into Spaced Out Radio for the first time. Donald, thank you so much for joining us. How are you tonight? Hello, I'm glad to be here. I'm doing great. Now, you're going the distance with us, so we really do appreciate you taking your important time to spend it with our audience. So thank you very much for that. Not a problem. The one thing I found interesting about reading up on you is you don't like the media. You don't like... No, I I, I don't. I don't. Uh, It's always... It pulls in so many directions. That's what I don't like about it. It takes away from uh, the reality of stuff. You know, you even get uh, some media will say it's only this, some media will say this, some media will... It's just a twisted nightmare when it comes to uh, radio and TV. I've been on uh, a few documentaries. I've been on radio shows before. I just prefer the the woods and the solitude. Now, where you are located, is it filled with forests and legends that have gone on for centuries? 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, but like with uh, most areas in the United States, we deal with logging and stuff like that. So like the rest of the world, we're losing our forests, and that will eventually lead to more discoveries. So going back in your history, when did you start learning about the legends, Donald, that you would eventually come to write about? Well, it, it started when I was a child. I always had visions. My uh, grandmother was uh, Hunk Papa Sue, so, and she was from the Blue Water uh, clan from Nebraska. And uh, her teachings, basically, were of the uh, what they call the White Buffalo Calf Society. And uh, I never learned her language. It was always my grandmother that had to translate for me whatever she was talking about. But anyway, I always had visions and uh, strange dreams. And a friend of the family named Ben Standing Crow, he basically took me under his wing because he figured that the dreams and visions that I were having at that age were so significant that he believed I could become a great shaman someday. Uh, ben Standing Crow was a Seneca, and that's of the Six Nations of the Iroquois. Um, I started under him, and that basically was at about eight years old. Um, it was at that same time period in my life when I first discovered something strange, and that was in the back swamp of our property, I noticed huge barefoot prints walking through the swamp in deep snow. And the reason I was back there is I was feeding. We had rats on the farm. So I would hunt the rats with traps, my BB gun, my bow and arrow, and take them out to feed this wolf that I had befriended out there. It was a black wolf. So I'd take a gunny sack out there with these rats, and I'd scatter them around and wait for the wolf to come and grab a couple and run off. Well, one day when I went out there, the sack was gone, and there was these tracks that led off. And they were gigantic human tracks, which totally freaked me out. Why would a person be out there in bare feet? So I told Ben about it. And... Right away, my grandfather, he was a skeptic. He always called uh, shamans and Ben mumbo-jumbo. So he wanted Ben to go out there with me and straighten us out. He figured it was some uh, railroad bum or something out there that was just using my rats for trapping or something. Well, Ben went out there with me and... He seen the tracks, and Ben was old at that time. He was probably, oh, I don't know, in his late 50s. I have never seen a guy run through deep snow so fast to get out of that swamp. And he had me in tow. I kept on saying to him, Ben, slow down. What are you doing? He kept on telling me, we've got to get out of here. Windingo. And <clears throat> wild man, he started screaming and stuff like this. This is all wrote in my book. The, uh, but um, he got back to the farm with me, and I kept on telling him, Ben, you can't, you can't tell my parents. See, my grandparents raised me, so when I say parents, that's what I mean. It's my grandparents. So I kept on telling him, Ben, you can't tell them that there's something out there like that. They'll never let me go in the woods again. I live in the woods. And he was very nice about it. He went up to the grandparents, and he told them right out, nope. It's some kind of trapper out there. Nothing to worry about. And then when he was leaving, he looks at me, don't go in that woods. Wow. But I was never a person to uh, follow instructions. <laughs> you know, I, I have personally had experience with two Bigfoot within 100 feet of me, and this happened uh, about four years ago now. Man, time is flying by since that happened. It was September, around September 10th of 2013. And the one thing that I've always said to people and and people who have not experienced anything like that, when you're out in the woods, 
and you see something that isn't supposed to exist, or is only by legend, or only by stories, you feel very small at that time, no matter how big or how grown up you are, don't you, Donald? Extreme, extreme. And as a uh, investigator of cryptozoology, one of the main things that I look for when I investigate a witness is the fear factor. When a person that I interview says to me, oh, I've seen it, but I wasn't worried, I wasn't scared, they're lying. That's immediately a lie. Anyone that sees something that is out of the normal, that is giant, that they've never seen before, they are going to be scared. I don't care how big you are, you could be the size of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Something that stands eight feet tall, pumping out probably 600 pounds, covered in hair, standing there staring at you, you ain't going to be calm. No, I know exactly how that feeling is. I know exactly what you're feeling when you say that, because... When you see something for the first time, Donald, whether you've been told the stories growing up as you have coming up in a First Nations culture, or you're just out in the wilderness on a hike, you know, spending some time trying to find that fishing hole, and you come across something that isn't supposed to exist, the emotions that go through you and the thoughts that go through your brain truly freeze you because you don't know how to react. How would you describe that to people when you're trying to explain, like, like as you said, I'm going to take your words here, where you said, you know, people are like, well, why didn't you go after it? Why didn't you take that photo? Why didn't you get closer to it? Explain those emotions. <laughs> your, your mind, basically, when something like that happens, you know, I've, I've seen them several times. When your mind, you, it's hard to explain, but I'm going to try. You do not focus on anything logical. Every amount of logic is out the window. You could have a camera around your neck. It's gone. You just forgot about it. When you're taking a picture, they always say, why are they so fuzzy? Well, you're shaking like a leaf. Unless you've got anti-shake on the camera, it ain't going to be a clear picture. It's, uh... Oh, that's about the closest I can get to it. No, you're exactly right. And I remember when I saw the Bigfoot, I just stood there in awe. Because there was two of them when I had my experience. The first one was doing its peering, hiding behind a tree in the shadows. Okay, I've and, had one of them. And it was doing the peering, you know, in and out, in and out. We It was about 100 feet away. We could make out the face. We could make out the right shoulder. And then as we started to turn around... That's when I saw this tree branch shaking at about one thirty on the clock. So if this first guy is at midnight on the clock, 12 o'clock on the clock, this next one, I, I saw this branch shaking at about one one thirty, And I stopped because I thought that was kind of weird. And that's where I saw the second one walk right through where that tree branch was shaking. And I got a full right side and back profile of this as it walked through where that tree branch shook. And I'll tell you, from about 85 feet away, man, that thing was huge. It was like a big, hairy version of Andre the Giant wa <laughs> walking through. But the one thing that captivated about me, and even closing my eyes telling you this story right now, Don, and our audience's story, was the fact that it had no neck. It just went shoulders to head. It was yep. absolutely amazing. Amazing. That is the, the, the sheer muscle that's in its upper body across its uh, shoulders connecting to the neck muscles pretty much eliminate any kind of neck. It's, it's there. It's just under so much muscle and fur, you can't see it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we bring you on the show tonight to discuss everything that is strange in the outdoors. And I love that, that title that you like to use. I really do. When you were a kid growing up, you mentioned 
a moment ago that you absolutely loved going out in the woods. And even though there was a Wendigo sighting and you were told not to go back in, you really didn't obey those type of orders that you were given for your own safety. What was it, Don, about the woods that just captivated you and still does to this day, even though you know that you're looking for something much bigger and much more powerful than you are? Oh, it's 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 a it's a gauntlet of things out there. It's the collecting of herbs for my medicine. It's uh, it's basically wildlife. Since I was a, a young child, I always dragged home wildlife. Orphan, I had uh, two bears, bear cubs that I raised to adults when I was little. Later on, I had a couple more bears that I raised from. They were orphans. I brought them home. I, that first, you know, the, even the black wolf, that followed me home. Um, I've had deer, I've had fox, coyote. I, it's always the, it, the the outdoors are just. I prefer it. There's no backstabbing out in the woods. There's no, uh, if you don't mind my word, there's no bullshit out in the woods. It, it's it's reality at its purest. That is probably one of the best ways I've ever heard it described, reality at its purest. And with everything that goes on in the forest, we all know about the natural critters that are out there. Some big, some small, some that can rip you apart. You know, I think in my area where I am in central British Columbia, just around here, I'm looking into my backyard 30 minutes before showtime, I've got deer out there. You know, we yep. have black bear, we've got grizzly bear, there's feral hogs, there's wild horses, there's moose, there's deer, there's elk, badgers. I'm glad I haven't ran into one of those yet. Never mind the foxes and the wolf packs that run around, and of course, we have the cougars. Yeah, that, uh, no, that, those, are, those are bad. Those are bad. Yeah, I mean, they're just angry that they're breathing. I'm, you know, honestly, they're just angry at life. You know, but there's a lot of things that can hurt you. But uh, there's also a lot of mystery and intrigue that goes along, Don, with with being a part and being one with the forest. Definitely. Why did you decide to listen to all those stories growing up and believe that they were accurate? Because there's so many First Nations legends out there that... Well, at first, I, at first I didn't. I, even my friend, Mitch, when I told him about it, you know, he, he was enthusiastic as hell about it. He kept on saying, oh, it's Bigfoot. I looked at him, what's Bigfoot? And he goes, oh, I seen a show the other day. I looked at him, okay, what show? It was Spock. He was on there. He was talking about it. And I go, what are you nuts? That's Star Trek. No, it wasn't Star Trek. He was a, it was a documentary. So he let me use his place at that time and on the farm. I didn't have no TV. So I went over there and watched the show. And, yeah, here was Leonard Nimoy. I forgot what the name of the show was. But, yeah, and here it showed the Patterson-Gimlin. And so after that, yeah, then I started to have a little bit of questions. I still was not a believer. Um, I talked to Ben about it. Ben, basically, after I mentioned Bigfoot to him, he, he joked about it. He goes, you mean Chief Bigfoot? I go, no, Mitch is talking about some giant ape with big feet. Ben just looks at me seriously, and he goes, Janusqua. And I go, what? He goes, Stone Giant. I still didn't know what was going on, you know, and I, I talked to him and kept on questioning about it and everything, and it was on my first quest on the big bog. He took me out there, and you know, I got, you know, the spiritual side of it. And it, it's just a, a build-up from childhood up until young adult where I started to believe more and more into the, uh, the teachings. Um, you know, you got a couple tribes out there that think that uh, the Sasquatch or the Janusqua is a physical only animal. 
but the majority of the Native American tribes out there believe the physical and spiritual have a key role in the Sasquatch. And so I want to and I want to get I and I want to get into that with you a little bit later because one of my pet peeves with Sasquatch researchers is the fact that they they tend to take the First Nation legend. And I and I hope, you know, I hope you don't find it offensive when I say First Nation because up here we call no, America no. Okay, thank you. I just want to clarify because up here in Canada that's what you know, we define First Nations as. We don't call yeah, them Indians yeah, that's, anymore. That's, so that's totally totally all right. Okay. First Thank Nation, uh, it's uh, native people. You know, any anything like that. It, even Native American doesn't really doesn't really matter. The only bad one is Indian. <laughs> yes, this because is that true. was uh, that was a Columbus name they gave to him for trying to find India. Yes. Thank you for the history lesson. The whole po- <laughs> the whole point that I'm trying to get at here is there are so many legends and stories that go around. I come from an area where I was born, about an hour east of where I was born in British Columbia. First Nations came up with the name Sasquatch by the Harrison Hot Springs area and the Chehalis First Nation. And that has always been, you know, one of those tribes that was very very protective and very very scared of the sasquatch you know they believed it was a shapeshifter they believed that it had some sort of supernatural power but there's a lot of researchers out there don who do not believe that we are dealing with anything of supernatural ability well you see and then i've got my thing you know i go with the shape-shifting and other spiritual because I have witnessed this and basically the reason I go with this if it was a totally physical only animal we would have found one by now everyone that's out there from Dyer to whoever that says they shot one when they go back for the body it's gone if they shoot one there ain't no blood People that have tracked them in deep snow going up a mountain, the tracks just stop. This is where the physical turns spiritual or goes into the spirit world. A lot of people try to explain the whole footsteps that just end in the snow, and I have heard of that here in British Columbia as well. What a lot of people will say is, well, Sasquatch has learned to backtrack in its own tracks in order to get out. But my opinion on that would be, would there not be two sets of toe prints? Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. And also to an expert tracker, I don't consider myself an expert, but I'm pretty good at it. A person that is, or an animal, that is backing up, backtracking, is not heavy on the heel. You can tell that they are heavy on the toes and pads if you're backing up if you're walking forward you're heavy on the heel person looking at those tracks that knows what they're doing will be able to differentiate one of the issues that I have is we have a lot of brilliant people who are researching this and like I just said moments ago, and I'm going to form it in a different way, they believe it could be a great ape that survived when we were all one continent here on the planet before they separated. They believe it could be Gigantopithecus or something along those lines, maybe even going as far as the missing link to mankind. Now, they don't buy into the whole spirituality or the supernatural ability of the creature. You mentioned that you have eyewitnessed it. But when you look at mainstream science trying to determine whether or not this creature is real, what is your opinion in regards to the way mainstream science is researching? Because all of their technological advances really are not solving the mystery. No, no, and it, it, it won't. Unless they look into it in a completely uh, different 
uh, aspect. One of the one of the aspects that I have, and I've, I've wrote an article, just a, a small post about the the way a shapeshifter would use uh, cell bodies, mutations, and stuff like that. And if you if you'd like, I could read it. I would love so, it if you did. Okay, all right. And uh, it, it's basically on a lot of the training as a shaman that I've gone through. All right, I'll, because there's no way I'd be able to just tell you about it. I have to. I got to re reread what I wrote. Okay, here goes. A shaman knows that the body contains trillions of symbiont organisms, cells, bacteria, or energies that both help and harm, rebuild, and destroy the host body. A shaman digs deep into the mind and body, feeling the ailment, then communicates with the symbiont organisms to ask for help. Good and bad spirits also enter the body and affect these organisms or energy, causing change and mutations that harm or sicken the host body. Certain herbs, whether eaten, drank, as tea, or smoked, affect the body and symbiont organisms, provoking action of defense from spirit attack or illness from bad elements. Shamans from different civilizations knew the body had these symbiont organisms, cells, and bacteria long before modern medical techniques found and documented them. Aztecs, Native Americans, Asians, and Egyptians knew the body was a host for many organisms that both built or both build, destroy, help, or harm, and the body or the organism could not exist without each other. In a sense, this is the connection all life has, a kindred relation, as man with animals, plant, earth, air, water, and fire. So also do we have a connection to the spirit world as energy. Some just know how to harness the power, speak, or listen. Like the bad organisms or spirits that destroy or mutate the host, so do some shamans mutate the cells or energy, and this transformation is known as shape-shifting. This is not impossible, as many think, and is common worldwide. We all see it in the animal world every day with plants, insects, reptiles, some fish, and amphibians. Whether it is a chemical, physical, or mental control of or with bodies, symbionts maintaining our body, it is possible to control sickness, appearance, mood, organ function, or health. So why wouldn't a forest-dwelling bipedal have the same ability to shapeshift using energy or physical ailments of the mind, body, and symbionts? There. That was that. <laughs> no, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Thank you so much for, for doing that. Do you believe, then, that mainstream science is dropping the ball by not investigating the legends and the stories that First Nations people have been telling for years? Yes. Yes, they are. Basically, as of late, they have been starting to listen. Um, I've distanced myself from the org. I used to belong to the, uh, and I do on a little shaded shadow there, the BFRO. I distanced myself from them because a few members basically in there called Indian legends and beliefs bogus, mumbo-jumbo. So that horribly offended me. And because all of this, even around the world before it's been circumnavigated, is all written on caves about them. Before white man had called it Bigfoot, the Indians had thousands of names for the Genosco or the Sasquatch, the Wendigo. Many legends of the tall man, the little people of the, of the forest. All this was long before any white man knew about them. Now that science is into it, they dismiss it. They look at it like, ah, what do they know? Well, <laughs> believe me, as a, as a shaman, the stuff that I have seen while in ceremony or rituals, when something sits across to you at a fire, 
and then it just vaporizes and it's gone, you start to think of other possibilities. I always go back to the fact that they haven't been able to find a Sasquatch body. They haven't been able to successfully kill one. Yes, there's been rumors that it has happened. Yes, there's been rumors that certain people have tried to spread the word that they're the ones who have it. They got the body. They have it stuffed in a freezer or they got the pelt of it. But it really has always turned out to be false. Yep, yep. And, and, and a black see, eye. And they can get harmed. They can, and when they are in their physical form. See, now what I believe is they miss that. The spirit of the Sasquatch misses the physical. I believe that at one time, thousands of years ago, they roamed the earth as all animals, as we do. But then either they were hunted out by man, tribes, or they just died off. Hunted, probably, like the Gigantopithecus. But now, in a spirit form, the only time they can enjoy what they miss is to come back as a physical. So, when they make a mistake, or someone is destined to see one through vision quest or whatever, and yeah, then they, they are seen. But then you get the ones that take a pot shot at them. There's never any blood, never any uh, bone fragments or bodies. They just vaporize and they go back into the spirit world where it's safe. Do you believe then that modern weapons that we have, we like what a rifle that hunters are using to, say, shoot a bear or a moose, have the ability to take down a Sasquatch? Uh, in the physical form, it can knock them down. But once it goes back into the spirit world, it's, it's useless. The, the, the gun is absolutely useless. The bow, the knife, any modern weapon that we have is totally useless against them. The only weapon that would somewhat harness them is the native rituals. I have a calling ritual. That's where the one was sitting right across from me at a campfire. You call them in. It's a ritual. Ben taught me how to do that. Um, you can speak to the spirit. Um, like one, I mean, it was very frightening. It just sat across from me and grinned. It didn't move, didn't do anything. It just grinned at me. And then I passed out. When I woke up, it was gone. But there was an impression in the moss right across from the fire where it sat. So when it comes to mainstream science, what do you think they are missing in their lack of discovery of true Sasquatch information? They have to look at not just one tribe. They have to look at all the tribes. All the tribes. They have to go around the, the world, not just Native Americans. They have to look at all tribes that have them documented. From Australia, you have to go to Australia. You have to go to the Himalayan mountain regions. You have to go down in Mexico. Everywhere where any kind of uh, culture has had recordings or on caves or anything like that for thousands of years, start there. After they do that, well, then they have to be trusted by the societies, native societies, in order to enter certain rituals. Once they do that, they're on their, on their way. We have and they have to get in the woods. And the other thing, they have to get in the woods. You can't find anything sitting in a lab. Mm -hmm. Do you believe, then, that, like Sasquatch, because I have heard dogman stories in regards to being shot 
and not f- going down whatsoever. You know, I, I've heard these stories. I've heard about Bigfoot being shot and the same thing happening. Do you think that there is something that heals this creature that it cannot be taken down? I mean, we see it all the time. I mean, there's a brand new television reality show called Killing Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. I, I, I had the producer contact me, add me on Facebook. It says, you know, hey, if you ever need a guest, I said, you know, you're never going to find the creature. You're never <laughs> going to find him. Yep. Yeah. Well, no, uh, the healing is basically all done spiritually. You know, you can shoot him, you can knock him down. It'll hurt him. But he'll just go right back, or she will go right back into the spirit world. That's an automatic heal right there. And then they just come back into the physical later, continue whatever they were doing. Mm-hmm. Whoever took the shot has nothing. You know, you, you, you just mentioned like the dogmen. Just like the, the, the Sasquatch, there's misidentifications out there. The, the dogmen, there's no doubt that something like that exists just with the, the Sasquatch. Um, you look at the uh, misidentification. Some people say it was this, it could have been a bear, it could have been a wolf. But then there is the there's there's two kinds of the the Sasquatch. There is the one that could be the Wendigo. The Wendigo could be the Dogman. You know, the the Dogman and Sasquatch could be on different levels. Uh, one is evil. One is calm. One is the protector of the woods and everyone or everything. The other feeds on your fear. Earlier in the show, you mentioned the stone giant. What did you mean by that term? That was a relatively new term for many of us around here. Uh, the Genusqua in the Seneca or the Iroquois Six Nations. That is the title they give Sasquatch, is the Genusqua, the stone giant. Stone giant means that basically, one, lives in a cave. Two, when you see it, it doesn't move. Stone. It just stands there. That's why you, you can walk right past it in the woods. The stone giant. Well, there is a reason why they call it the reigning hide-and-seek champion. <laughs> yep. And like, and like I said, too, it's, it took me up until, my God, I, I was 20, in my 20s, before I started to thoroughly believe and even with all the training Ben was doing with me and documentaries I've watched uh, people in the BFRO I've talked to and stuff like that it was it was just I don't know to me it was not something I wanted to believe in I live in the woods but then you see too many things out there that don't make sense, and eventually you start piecing together the spirit world with the physical. I've even, I even at one point created a special weapon to test my theory, but uh, never got the chance to use it. What it was was just a plain old bow and arrow. I had holes drilled all over in the arrow. So when the arrow would go into a leg, it wouldn't kill. But the arrow itself, with all them holes, would fill with blood. Therefore, I would have proper DNA. And then, of course, that... Oh, go ahead. Did you get any DNA? Eh, no. But later in, in time, in 2015, well, out on the Great Bog, I had come across... A coyote den. I was following a pack of wolves through the area, and I come across a coyote den out there. And peeking down into there, into the den, I noticed a pretty large stick blocking one corner of the hole. I reached down in there, tugged on it. It wouldn't come out. Started crawling down in there, digging at it, just so I could get down into the den, pulled it out. There's a giant femur bone. 
So, when the, you know, when the hair on the back of your neck stands up, uh, that's what happened to me out there when I found that. I immediately felt like something was watching me, that this shouldn't be. I got out of there. Well, came back a couple days later, picked it up, took off with it, got out of there, came back again, started digging around. I found teeth. Well, I sent all this to a university. To this day, they still have not gotten back to me. I wanted them to do DNA tests. So right now I've got someone else out there checking into the university for me, find out what's what's going on. I believe what it is. They have found something. They know I'm going to ask for my items back. But what, what I told this guy to tell him, I don't care if you guys keep it. Keep it on display. Keep it for research. I just want the credit for finding it. But do anyway, you, that's... Do you believe oh. that the Sasquatch is a multitude of species that has different personas in different parts of North America. For instance, the creature up here in Cascadia in the in the Pacific Northwest tends to be a little bit more benevolent, a little bit more shy, a little bit more not wanting to be around people will try to escape. Whereas we hear stories from the South that the swamp monsters there are a little bit more aggressive and, and more willing to attack. Do you believe that there are different species of this creature well if it is going into a physical uh, being then yes you've got uh, the farther north you go you're gonna have the bulkier ones they're gonna be more laid back calm because they have to conserve energy now you go down into the southern region over by the skunk ape of Florida they're gonna be smaller they're gonna be leaner and, yeah, they're going to be a little bit more moody. So they've got other things to deal with. They've got gators in the water. They've got bugs year-round. They've got diseases from the water and other things. They've got people everywhere. You get farther up north where there's fewer people, they're a little bit more calm. I don't know if that's a good explanation, but... Do you feel then that along the lines of the legend that Sasquatch finds you, you don't find it? Pretty much. Pretty much. Yep. You are if you're if you see one, it was meant to be. Uh, there's been other instances where a child is lost or someone's lost out there. They'll get the Sasquatch or Genosco will leave little telltale signs, even mock other animals, so you start to follow, and you'll, he'll lead you right to a road. Um, yeah, you, you're meant, if, you're, if you see one, it was meant to be. Uh, there's other legends with the Native Americans that basically say if you weren't meant to, see one and you just happened along one bad things will happen you either get sick uh, bad luck you'll die I've had that happen to two people two very close friends of mine and researchers that it happened to how did they pass away well they were both both young well, one was a female she was about 30 years old the other was a, a guy, he was about uh, 45. Uh, we were up in the Michigan area doing an expedition. And uh, we were all on the road. Just, it was night, we were using thermals. And the woman at first seen it down the road. We were walking. I turned around and I looked down the road too. And she goes, it's, it's, it's a ball. I go, well, I'm looking through the thermal, too. I go, yeah, what, what is that? It's like a severe uh, coming down the road. And then she yells, oh, no, it's got arms. 
And I'm looking, I still can't make anything. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, now I see it. It's, uh, but then we get on the radio, we call them guys to get down there quick. First one is the guy, he gets there. He grabs one of the thermals, he looks down there, and yeah, here they are. See, the other thing we can pick up with the thermals are all the rodents on the road. There's rodents running everywhere. Well, here you got this gigantic one. We have no idea of size, but it's well over six feet. He's just standing there like he's garden, like all the other littler ones are running around, scooping up and eating these rodents. We're picking this all up with thermal. All three of us are freaking out. And just like that, either the big one noticed us standing there they all just took off running into the sides of the uh, ditch lines and then just like that we could hear them running through the brush on both sides of the road next to us me and the woman we got back to back the guy he took off running for camp me and her, you know what it's like when you're in a room and someone passes by you and you can feel that breeze? We were feeling that continuously going right past us. But the thermal wasn't picking anything up. It was just forces was going right past both of us. We were pretty much locked together in fear. Well, anyway... About two years later, she died. She just all of a sudden got some kind of blood disease and died. The guy, a year later, he didn't wake up from bed. He got some kind of his lungs filled with fluid. He was drowned in his own in his own fluids. Those two were not meant to see that. That's scary if Bigfoot has that type of supernatural power. And it's, it is not only that. I've had other expeditions. Skeptics, actual skeptics were with us. And all of a sudden, the skeptic just falls to the ground and starts bawling uncontrollably, shaking and convulsions. Well, looking at her like, what the hell is going on? It's called infrasound. Mm -hmm. A Sasquatch can produce infrasound that certain people will pick it up and or it can be directed. And that does something to their, either their nervous system, their brain, where it induces fear, sickness. Uh, two of the researchers there introduced me to infrasound. I had no idea what that stuff was. I, I, I myself thought that was mumbo-jumbo until I seen this skeptic fall to the ground. When we got her back to camp and she was all calmed down, she was apologizing like mad for disrupting our field work. She didn't know what happened. She just It just hit her like a sledgehammer. She was all of a sudden so scared that she couldn't move, she just fell down. That's infrasound. Mm. We only have about three minutes left before we got to go to break here, about two and a All half. Right. When you look at this creature and you try to figure out what it is, what is your best description of this creature's definition? Well, since I'm not positive on anything you know i have my beliefs if it is into the native legends which i have been taught i would say physical and energy spirit if it's a physical only then i would have to say it would have to be something that has either been mutated by man or is a leftover from far, far long ago that no one has discovered yet. But I tend to shy away from that because if it was physical and only physical, 
we would have had one by now. That's the hard part. That's the hard part is figuring out where it is. Do you think the government knows about this? Uh, no. No, there's all these conspiracy theories saying that they know it's out there and all this stuff like that. I don't think so. If if they see and if they did, my question has always been would they really want the public to know about it? If the public knew about it, they'd panic. It would be a mass panic. There would be not just one group out there killing Bigfoot. Everyone with a rifle would be out in the woods trying to kill it. Anything that people don't know about, they fear. If they fear it, they want to kill it. That is so true, isn't it? it it's really sad desire of our society that we would want to take out a creature like this because in the end, we don't know how many there are out there. We could be dealing with a hundred. We could be dealing with a thousand or possibly more. North America is a pretty big place and we really don't know where these populations are or how many are in a family. Are they wanderers? Are they nomads, vagabonds? We really don't know much about them and we will get to more with Donald B. Young Jr. coming up after our break here at the top of the hour. While we're on a break, make sure you check out spaceoutradio.com. Make sure you're hooking up with us on all the social media as well because I want to see you added. So we'll be right back. More Sasquatch talk, more cryptid talk right after this. From coast to coast to coast, Black Light Uncharted is taking on the paranormal across Canada. From ghostly hauntings to the UFOs flying above in conjunction with MUFON Canada, we are closely investigating what's going on in the northern skies and checking out the apparitions that walk among us. Check out our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. We want to know your thoughts, we want to hear your experiences, and we want you to share your stories. The answers are out there, and we intend to find them. Would you like to become one of our space travelers? All you have to do is click on the space travelers icon at spacedoutradio.com. For only $5 a month, you can get access to some great prizes, as well as private monthly shows, newsletters, and a members-only section on our website. Become a space traveler today. The third Monday of every month, Spaced Out Radio is going to bring you a different look at everything paranormal. Welcome to The Reporters. Jim Mallard, Vanessa Hogle, Denise Garcia, and Christina George join me, Dave Scott, for a look at the weird and strange from the other side of the microphone. We'll break down ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, and the people investigating them. The paranormal media has never been heard like this. Come listen to The Reporters. It's paranormal news at its finest. Welcome to The Encounter. At spaceoutradio.com, The Encounter Online is SOR's trusted news source for everything weird and strange going on around the world. This is news editor Eric Markham. Our team of journalists are scouring the planet for those strange stories that rarely make the mainstream. No fear-mongering or fake news here. Head over to spaceoutradio.com and encounter The Encounter. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy on your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? Have you had an experience you can't explain? Had a run-in with ghosts, maybe Bigfoot, or seen lights in the sky? Hi, I'm Mike Schmidt from the SOR Sight Lines. I'm here to investigate your sighting. Head to spacedoutradio.com and fill out a report on the sight lines. All your information is 100% confidential, and I will help you figure out what you've been seeing. File your report, and let's find out the answers together. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? 
Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Have you got your Cosmic Passport? If you need one, tune in to Cosmic Passport on Spaced Out Weekend. This is Elizabeth Anglin, ET experiencer, spirit medium, and host of Cosmic Passport. Each weekend, I'll be bringing you interviews and support from other paranormal experiencers and the best in intuitive spiritual guidance from across the globe. It's all happening starting at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, midnight Eastern, on spacedoutradio.com. From British Columbia to Northern California, Pacific North Weird has Cascadia covered. Check out our feature videos at spacedoutradio.com, where I... Vincent Zunza and my super sleuth partner Alexandra Sullivan track down the weird and strange stories from around the Pacific Northwest, from Bigfoot to Mel's Hole and everything in between. This is what makes life exciting. So why report the normal when we can report the Pacific North Weird? Right here at spacedoutradio.com. Oh, there's only one way to rock, loud and proud. In high definition, Radio 702 Rocks, Las Vegas. Every Saturday and Sunday night, as Dave Scott wanders aimlessly in the wilderness, you can come hang out with me, James Tyson, and Spaced Out Weekend. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I'll take you along as we talk with some of the best experts in their fields. Spacedoutradio.com is the place to find us. So sit down, relax, put your feet up, enjoy the topics like the paranormal, supernatural, intuitiveness, and so much more. Hope to see you there. Don't have time to listen to Spaced Out Radio Live? Wherever you are, the car, the office, the shower, or even if you're traveling, we're right here for you. Each Spaced Out Radio show can be found on iTunes, TuneIn, and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's the perfect way for you to catch up on our shows. For more information, just head over to our website, spacedoutradio.com, and tune in to us today. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. And hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Welcome back to the second hour of Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the program, Albert Jack is going to join us. We're going to talk about the Glenn Miller conspiracy going back way to World War II. We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. We want to welcome in our terrestrial stations. WQEE 99, Rock the Key down in Noonan, Georgia, home of the Walking Dead. We're also live in New Orleans on the United Public radio network on 107.7 FM. Good to have you with us. We're live on KTLK, the Fringe FM in Las Vegas on Renegade Talk Radio. And if you're listening in on Revolution Radio, remember the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Head on over to freedomslips.com and donate today. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Anti disestablishment terrorism. I butchered that. Anti disestablishment. Uh, Bill, you did it to me again, damn it. Anti disestablishment terrorism. There we go. Bill sets the password each and every night right here on the mighty SOR. And yes, he tries to tongue tie me with the password each and every night. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Bill. 
If you want to follow us on social media, you can do so on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio if you want to connect with me live during the show as well. You could give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune us in on TuneIn. Download this show and others on iTunes. We're on RadioGuide.fm, TalkStream Live, Player FM, and Stitcher. Our website is SpacedOutRadio.com, where we have a plethora of... I'm still pissed off about that password. We have a plethora a plethora of information available to you by going to our website, including the encounter online. Read up on it. We got some great stories there as well. Let's just get into the Bigfoot. I'm all tongue tied now after anti disestablishmentarianism. Don't know why I couldn't say that at the time, but that's okay. Donald, our young junior, is our guest tonight. He is a Sasquatch researcher. He's got an incredible book called Trail of the Sasquatch A Shaman's Journey. I highly suggest you pick it up. You can go to trail-of-the-sasquatch.webs.com to learn more about that. Donald, welcome back. I'm glad to be here. Oh, on that point that you just uh, said, if that was too hard of an address, they can just go to the uh, my main website and they can find it there or just type in Trail of the Sasquatch Shaman's Dirt Journey on Amazon. But if they want... It easier just go to Rep Lures. That's R E P L U R E S dot webs dot com. That's my main website. It's also got a link on there to the book website. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much for filling us in on that. I want to get to some questions from our audience if you don't mind. Eric right. Eric is asking, do you believe Sasquatch is at a higher vibratory level? And they are only material for brief times. Yes. Yes. Um, and when they when they're in a, a safe safe zone, so to speak, they will uh, material into the physical world from the spirit world. Uh, when they come in contact with any kind of people or anything like that, they go back into the spirit world. They could be there for months if, into the physical if there's no disturbance. Why do you think they're so easily able to make that change? Well, that, that goes into a whole new realm that, like we had mentioned before with science, something that not even shamans understand. It is... Uh, it's a transference, and I, I myself, I don't even understand that. But I believe it is happening. Um, as far as understanding how they can transfer from the spirit world into physical world, that would be more or less on a, a ghostly almost aspect Trip has a question here he is saying what is your thoughts on the skunk ape having four toes instead of five well <laughs> I don't know what to say about that one. Uh, four toes it's I, I don't know I am that Dunfounds me as well. Um, four toe basically has a lot of times been mistaken for a bear. Mm -hmm. um, a, a bear imprint will step into the same imprint as the front and back paw. Um, I'm not saying that the skunk ape is a bear or the four toed is a bear. Um, it just could be either a mutation. Because, like I mentioned before, cell mutation. Um, I, I have no idea. I, with my experience, my experience is right here in the Wisconsin, Michigan area. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what's going on down into the Florida area. 
All right, let's get to another couple questions from Eric here. He is asking, do you think that maybe down south that inbreeding in the creatures is more prevalent due to the encroachment of their habitat by development? If physical, um, I don't think so. Most animals will have a uh, protective knowledge. Any, any animal will know automatically not to uh, do that. You, you know, you've got the great apes and stuff like that that will jump around from the females even though they are sisters and uh, mothers and stuff like that, but the female will usually shun them and push them away. So there, I, I, I don't think there's too much interbreeding with them. I don't think there's very much breeding at all if they're uh, physical. I would say that their lifespan is similar to that of a human. Um, they want to keep their populations down. It's different than, you know, if it was long ago when there wasn't very many uh, humans around. Now they have to keep their numbers down, pods small. Otherwise, you know, they... they they have the, probably the same fear. If you have too many, you're going to make too much of an impact on the uh, environment where people are going to notice these huge areas. You, know, you look at compounds that people uh, have out there or expeditions, stuff like that. You have 20 people out there. Look at the impact that that does. The grass and trees are all marked, and there's scat everywhere. There's... Uh, grass knocked down where tents were or beds were and stuff like that. So, yeah, you got a couple, no impact. Bunch of them, big impact. So I don't, I don't think they're uh, interbreeding or anything like that. I think that's uh, no. Eric's follow-up question, have you ever studied the Dewey Lake monster in southwestern Michigan? Mm, don't sound familiar. No, right. what, what is that? It's a weird-looking thing. It almost looks like half dogman, half Sasquatch. It's, it's a weird, weird-looking creature. Big teeth. Big, big uh, teeth. No, I haven't. At hashtag Spaced Out Radio on Twitter, Robert, one of our brand new listeners, thank you, Robert, for taking us in and coming on over to Twitterverse with us. He is asking, there are a lot of theories out there that Bigfoot might be part of inner Earth, that they mostly live underground. What it would be your thoughts on that? Well, you mean like the Morlock? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was just a joke. No, yes, it could be. It could be. In the... Uh... Uh, some of the native beliefs out there, you have the inner world, the upper world, the outer world. Um, I've even thought that, um, you know, you have the cave dwellers, inner world. It, it could be, you know, a lot of my past thoughts, if it was a physical, would have been the reason they have a lot of this musty smell is that it is from earthen, where they're going under banks of rivers, in caves, culverts, sewers, and cities. So yes, they could be earth dwellers. Let's get to Bob's question in the SOR Space Travelers Club. He is asking, they say if you want to see or interact with Bigfoot, you should leave your weapons at home. But how do you protect yourself from other predators like wolves, bears, and cougars? Well, if you go into the woods, you don't really have anything to worry about with the other animals, especially like here in Wisconsin. You know, we've got wolves, we've got bear, we've got bobcats, stuff like that, coyotes. Um, you have, unless you're smearing yourself down with bacon, you ain't really got anything to worry about. During the rut of the white-tailed deer, you got more chance of getting injured by a deer than you do a predator. So, yeah, go out, 
is don't show fear. That's the main thing. It's hard to do. You know, it's it's easy for a person to say, don't be scared. Well, when you're in the woods and all of a sudden there's a four or five hundred pound black bear that just comes around a tree and he's looking at you, yeah, it's hard to say, don't be scared. But if you take off running, his instinct is going to be food, prey. They're running. If you stand your ground, they're just going to keep on going. That's totally different now with a grizzly or a, a big cat. Um, yeah, you really you see a grizzly can't climb a tree, so your best bet is to shimmy up a tree. Mm -hmm. Won't work with a cat. <laughs> Around here, a lot of people, when they go hiking, they actually wear face masks on the back of their head because the cougars like to attack from behind. Yep. Uh, they'll take out the uh, the neck. Mm -hmm. They go after the spot. But I, what I basically, during expeditions, I have told people, a lot of them I have seen carrying mace. I've told them that is about the most useless item you could possibly have with you. You're out there at night. You're scared. Something comes running out of the brush. Are you going to hose everyone down with that thing trying to hit it? Can't see it. Can't aim. Your best thing, if you've ever been to a football game, these little can horns. If you ever had those, a little tiny can, it's an air horn, get one of those. You don't have to aim it. You just push the trigger and it goes off. That'll scare the hell out of anything. Well, that high-pitched noise will freak me out, I can tell you that. <laughs> I can tell you that. Ron from Saskatchewan, and we feel sorry for him because he hasn't seen a mountain in years, is asking, is the Wendigo Bigfoot? They talk about the Wendigo in Saskatchewan as well. The Wendigo in the Chippewa or Ojibwa is the cannibal or a wild cannibal man. Um, some some believe, some of the tribes believe that it could be the same as the Sasquatch. It could be the same as the Genusqua in the uh, Iroquois. I myself believe it to be totally different. The Wendigo is said to be also the tall man. It's... Uh, it, that, now, in most of the cultures that believe in the Wendigo, it is a spirit. That is not a physical. Um, the Wendigo basically is uh, from the spirit world. That, that is with most of the uh, tribes that believe in it. Um, it is vicious. It's not like the... Uh, common beliefs of the Sasquatch, which is the calm defender of uh, and protector of the land. The Wendigo basically is a cannibal. Uh, it, it is in the form of a man. It starts in the, in the form of a man. That is where the main thing of the shapeshifter came from, was the Wendigo. Let's get to another question here. This one comes from Bob as well. If Bigfoot is a spirit-like creature, why does it eat flesh like deer or other animals when they are in form? It, it misses it. It misses it. When it comes into physical form, it, it's coming into the physical form from the spirit world because it misses it. In the spirit form, it can't enjoy the the smells, the flavors that it used to thousands of years ago when it did walk the earth. So yes, it, it, everything that it can do physically when in the physical form, it will. Whether it's eating and raiding someone's orchard, cornfield, following a deer, breaking its neck and eating its heart, it will do it. It goes back into the spirit world, None of that is there. All right, let's get to Gail's question. Gail is asking, could a reason Sasquatch avoids humans be that 
it maybe carries germs or viruses that are harmful, and he's actually protecting us. Well, it's a very good one, and it could go the opposite way. If the Sasquatch is physical, it could go the other way. It may not be worried about us. It's worried about itself. Look at what Amer or, uh, the white man has done to the Native Americans when it first came over here. There was the pox and stuff like that that was spread like fire. So, yeah, the, the Sasquatch instead would be thinking of that. It has seen diseases through generations. It's seen the first people or the Native Americans get sick. So, yeah, he don't want, he don't want to take that back to his pod. Plus, he's been shot at. If it's like the Gigantopithecus, it's been hunted by the natives. This is an inherent fear. All right, let's get to another question here from Gail as well, a follow-up. Do you feel that he has to have some sort of human protection activated for humans to safely see Sasquatch? If they are surprised, perhaps a protection is not active? I didn't understand that. Have well, to... in, in, in reg that's in regards to when I asked you earlier, you know, that Sasquatch allows you to see him. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, it's in the physical form, they have the same abilities as any other animal. Um, the majority of animals use stillness. You see a, a deer bedded down, they won't move. A wolf bedded down, they won't move. They're standing there, they won't move. Maybe they'll twitch an ear once in a while or flick a tail a little bit. But they ain't going to move. Sasquatch will do the same thing if in the physical. They will just basically stand there in the shadows, just watching. Um, in the spiritual, well, they just have to just vanish. They're standing in the shadows already. Now they become the shadow. Do you believe that Sasquatch are rummagers that will go through garbage bins? Very much so, if in the physical form again. Or when they come from the spirit world, oh yeah, we, we are the most wasteful species on the earth. Most people say that, oh, they can't live in the city. Oh, bull. That is a gold mine. Stuff that people, even the homeless, won't eat. These guys, that, I mean, they... <laughs> It, they they have uh, that's a gold mine coming into a city, a small town, a dump, anything like that. Yeah, they they will. And there's the other thing, the giant sewers of a big city. Now there's a nice heated cave. They come up into the cities at night, go into an alley behind a restaurant. The smell of the food. Draws them in, the grease and everything like that. They watch from the shadows. This guy comes out of a door. He lifts this big lid, drops a bag in there. Well, now they just learned how to open this huge box. Now they go up to it. They lift it, look in. Wow. There it is. It's not only got food that these humans are throwing in there. There's little rats in there for snacks. <laughs> Me rambling. This comes from Junebug at Revolution Radio. One of their hosts on the radio state show named Douglas Dietrich, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him or not, but he's a pretty conspiratorial guy, believes that the skunk ape was part of a Sasquatch human hybrid program originating in Cuba. What do you think? It, like I said, uh, in the physical, it could be. You look at what the Russians had started a long time ago during World War II. They were experimenting with apes, trying to make a super warrior. You never can tell. Um, uh, the human is one of the most evil species out there. I've had reports of people 
literally having sex with chimpanzees and stuff like that. Let me see. Bubbles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you threw in some trailer park boys. <laughs> I had to think there for a second. I really had to. Well, yeah, there there could be stuff like that. You got scientists that all of a sudden, you know, that that say, for instance, a chimpanzee and the orangutan are the closest to the human genome. So yeah, of course you're going to get scientists that are poking and prodding and everything else, trying to make something that's not natural, and something will get out. You look at all these zoos that have had either weather disasters. Stuff like that. Well, you have laboratories that have gotten into these earthquakes or tornadoes. All of a sudden they go in there. Do they want to really tell the government that they just lost an experiment? I don't think so. Let's move on to the whole shape-shifting subject here because this is a big one for a lot of people. I am a firm believer that they are able to cloak themselves. A little bit different than shape-shifting, but a few days after my own personal experience, we felt that we were being followed. And this was on a neighbor's property, and behind they had a forest where we saw the Sasquatch. And then a few days later, we were doing a perimeter walk. They had a lot of paranormal activity on their yard. And we felt like we were being followed, and we turned and looked back, and there was pixelation standing beside a Chris, uh, Christmas tree, pardon me, a lo- an old cherry tree. And only two of the four of us could see that pixelation. And we continued on walking another 10, 20 seconds before we heard the sheer yell slash roar of this creature. Do you believe that Sasquatch has the ability, I know you believe that it, it can shape shift, but do you believe it can also cloak itself and be literally right in front of you without you even knowing? Oh, of course. It's, it, anything that can come from the spirit world can do stuff that science has no comprehension of. Um, as far as standing in, say, like a shadow, you can walk right past it. You can sense it. You know, I'm, I'm sure you felt that already. I feel it continuously when I'm in the woods. You'll be walking, and you know something's watching you or something's standing over there, but you can't see it. And that is a, a, a good sign. Another thing with that is it's, it's, not, just, it's not just a Sasquatch. It's basically the, uh, the forest spirits, other animals, animals that we know. There's um, another belief is basically when you go hunting. You'll get one guy that'll go out there after a deer. He won't see a thing. Another guy will go out the same area. There's a big, nice buck come out. And he'll, the buck won't move, even though a whole bunch of hunters just went there. The buck will just stand there and look at him. It is the spirit of the animal giving itself to you. The Sasquatch would be the same thing. If you're not meant to see it, you're not going to. And as far as, like you're saying, with the shape-shifting, yeah, they can stand right next to you. You won't see them. They won't leave an imprint. Anything. Kind of like a chameleon. They stand next to a tree and just be a part of it or part of the shadow. So with this shape-shifting that takes place... How do you think the creature has the ability to do that? Well, like I had said, it's it's all in manipulation of the cells. Um, They speak to, like uh, any shaman can speak to the, the cells that build us all. And you can... Like uh, with martial artists and stuff like that, they can control their breathing, they can slow their heart, they can uh, stop organs, they can uh, feel every movement of an organ or whatever in their body, Uh, cells that are bad like cancer or uh, toxins, they can 
a person or a shaman that feels it can have it removed. Well, the same is with mutating these cells. Um, I'm not sure exactly how a chameleon does it, but that is the, the same basis that I'm going on, is to mutate its own cells and transfer. Do you believe the creature is from here, or do you believe that it has always been on Earth? Ooh, um, I believe that at one time it was a physical animal or being of the Earth. Um, of course, who knows? You know, every one of us people could be from outer space. So could that. Who knows? I believe everything here. Well, that's a scientific fact that everything on the earth is from outer space. We are in outer space. Um, so that's a, that's a it's a hard one, but a, at the same time, an easy one. You know, we're all in space, so we're from outer space. Um, <laughs> With the shape-shifting that goes on, does it have the ability, in your opinion, to do this at any time that it wants, or can it only do things like this at certain times? No, it can do that anytime, anytime. Just like a very good shaman uh, at any, any given time um, can diagnose a person by listening to the cells. And so can a, a Sasquatch... Uh, listen to its own cells, change. Now, if it's using the spirit world, well, that's totally different. Then it's it's like a like a ghost. It's using the energy of the of the earth and the sky. Um, it's using all the elements to do what it has to. You mentioned about having the ability with shape shifting that it can also heal itself in physical form. How do you come up to that conclusion that it has this ability? Well, like with my with my practice as a shaman, I've you know diagnosed people with cancers. There's there's certain uh, things if you you got to really as a shaman, you got to really concentrate into the person and you can you can literally i don't know maybe it's just just me or other shamans but we can literally feel it um and then from there you ask for the cells to help you it, it you have to help yourself the cells are you if it's it's hard to explain. It's just something I know how to do. It's um, a person is built up of all these cells. You can't live without the cells, and the cells can't live without you. So there is a mutual communication. Most everyone does not have this inner communication with themselves. Um, if you can master it to uh, speak to the cells that are constructing you, then you can heal. A Sasquatch would, most, a physical Sasquatch would most likely have that. And not only that, they would have the knowledge that every other animal out there has. If they've got a parasite, which plant to eat to get rid of the parasite, a wound, what to chew up, and spit on the wound to disinfect it. You know, it's just, uh, well, it's, it's hard to explain. Would that be from living in nature? Because nature has a plethora of cures out there for many different types of injuries, diseases, so on and so mm. forth. I mean, there has to be a, a good reason why we've seen animals get hurt, but they're able to continue on 
you know, we've seen, you know, deer and moose that have absolutely huge scars on their backs from getting away from bears and cougars, and yet the marks heal. And we look at it when they're fresh and we think, you know, there's no way that that animal would be able to survive, yet it does. How do you see or what do you think nature does to help the animals heal themselves? Because couldn't Sasquatch be using those as well? Well, yeah. It, it, the humans have lost the majority of, of that. And it's, if you, like you said, if a deer gets shot, a leg blown off or whatever by a hunter, it'll limp off. Now, if that happens to a modern-day human, they're going to drop there right on the ground and bleed to death because they are going to panic. An animal will panic for a brief second of fear, then find a place to lay down, calm down. Their heart rate will slow. They will automatically find a place of safety that they can reduce their heart rate, look into themselves. They'll keep the wound clean. Um, And if it's other things, like I said, with parasites or anything like that, animals, animals know. Uh, Me as a shaman, I know I can walk into the woods, and if a plant, it just, it, it looks different. It stands out. You go into the woods, this plant is, it's, it's like it's got an aura to it. You pick it, and it's for something. An animal automatically knows. A Sasquatch would automatically knows what will heal certain things. In, in nature, for every ailment, there is a plant that will cure it. Do you believe, then, besides the shape-shifting, that Sasquatch has other mystical powers? Well, it's, I know for a fact, because I've heard them, they are definite mockers. They have a vocabulary that is out of this world. They can imitate a woodpecker, a squirrel, a coyote, wolf, anything you can imagine. Like at, at one point with uh, one expedition, they've even mocked us talking at the campfire. And that, no one was out there in the woods. But yeah, what we're, we're speaking, I can't remember the woman's name exactly, but everyone, you know, would be talking to her because she was at that time. And a couple of us had said her name. I can't remember the name, so this may not be it, but I'm just going to say Beth. Okay, you know, we're just talking to her. Oh, what do you think, Beth? All of a sudden, everyone pauses for a second or whatever, and way out in the woods, Beth. Everyone's hair stood up. Now, like with, with coyotes and that, I know what a real coyote sounds like. When they're imitating them, yeah, they, you can tell it's not a coyote. Um, I've even wrote a post about that, about that I don't believe in these people that are out there howling and stuff like that, trying to call them. You know, that, it's like in my post. You don't know what you're saying. You don't know what you're doing. That'd be like if you went over to Japan, you've never been there, you don't speak Japanese, All of a sudden, you just start listening to the people. You watch what they start doing, and you just start mocking them. You'd be an idiot. So, yeah, they, they, the Sasquatch has very good uh, vocabulary as a skill. They are extremely intelligent as far as communication with structures and stick structures and stuff like that to alert and it's more or less like signs to the other in the in the group. If they come up to a road, they're gonna make a, a small little cross. If they see if there's a trapper line about ten feet before the trap, they're gonna just bend over a stick and poke the top into the ground so it looks 
just like a trap. Do you believe that Sasquatch has the ability to be telepathic? There are very many people out there who say that they have felt when they've been in the wilderness that they have heard someone in their mind speaking, although they cannot see. These are good people, not people who've ever had this type of experience before. I'm not I'm not sure on that. Uh, I know they do have the infrasound. Um, it would make only sense that they can... But, you know, then if they would go into your mind, that means that they would have to know your language. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure on that one. I've never had that where they have literally spoke to me like that. Mm-hmm. Well, I know people in British Columbia and Washington State who have had that happen. So I found okay. it. I've had found that very interesting to learn in regards to it. Do you believe, though, that Sasquatch will leave gifts? Oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> They've done that for me, and I've done that for them. Oh yeah. Explain if you, that. If, well, the first time I did it was with uh, Ben taught me. It was with honey milk. You just take a little bowl of. Pure milk can't be anything you buy in the store. It has to be fresh squeezed from the cow or the goat. And then you just put a little bit of honey into it, mix it up, and you put that out there. That That's that's uh, spirits, good spirits love that. Sasquatch loves that. Oh, other animals love it. But Anyway, usually they will leave something that's a prize to them. But to you, it's just, what is that? It's, that's nothing. Like this one time, I left a gift out there, and I come back, and there's just a little tiny smooth pebble that was like, this was in the middle of a swamp. This was something that was polished from a river. So it's just something that is meaningless. To me, but to them, that's neat. That's that's like our diamond. Another time, it was uh, uh, Ben had told me to go and check this one deer that was out there because I thought it was a guy that stole my deer. So I went and looked, and it, it was a, a Sasquatch that basically took the carcass. But in the uh, area of it, I found a little piece of green wood, no, green decaying wood. It's got a scientific name for it, but it glows when you turn off all the lights and everything. This little green piece of wood glows. Well, that was right where the deer was. So, yeah, they they leave gifts, Um, and the reason it took the deer is because it figured that was my gift. I had shot it during the archery season, and I went back to the farm to get the tractor to uh, haul it back. But when I came back, the deer was gone, and there was no sign of dragging it. This was a big deer. No one's going to throw this over their shoulder and run it out. But there was no blood trail, nothing. I guess that that whole story is in in the book, too. Everett has a question for you here. He is asking, if Bigfoot is a spiritual being, can it choose the location where it manifests in the physical world, or is each one bound to a specific region or location? No, they can go anywhere. The spirit world is infinite. They can go from the Himalayas to the sewers of New York. Wherever they wherever they want, they can. If someone is meant to see them, they're going to be right there. Skeptic, but there is no. Go ahead. There is no between them in the spirit world. There is no territorialism. Now, see, I have in the physical, I have had a territorial confrontation with one. What was that? That also. 
that was very frightening. I even had a deer rifle with me. And that uh, they even had, that was on uh, Monster Quest about that one. But no, I'm, it was a uh, hunting season. I'm sitting on a hill on a power line. Uh, I had to go and take a piss, so I wander off of the power line into the woods, take a piss by this little tree. Didn't think anything of it. I, well, I never piss next to where I'm hunting. So I was about, I don't know how far, probably 50 feet into the woods. So I come back, and I look down below the hill, and I just caught what, to me, could have been a bear. It was basically the, the calf and heel and buttocks of something going into the brush. So I'm, I'm thinking bear. Well, 15 minutes pass. I take a couple of drinks of my coffee from the thermos. I hear heavy breathing and growling off to the side. I click the safety off, face the direction. And just like that, this little tiny maple tree, I'd say probably three inches in diameter, starts with, it's probably, I don't know, 25 some feet high, still has got some of the fall leaves on it. Just like that, it starts slashing back and forth, back and forth. All the leaves are just flying off of this thing. The wind from it is just moving the other trees. I booked. I left my thermos back there. I left my cup there. My binoculars were left there. The only thing I grabbed was my gun and took off running. Next day, came back there. Quite nervous, quite scared. My thermos was gone. Couldn't find that right away. My binoculars, they were there. They were moved. Found them. After a while, I found my cup. That was probably moved about 20 feet away. Thermos was off in the other side of the power line in the woods. Found that only because it had a blaze orange strap on it. And then I thought, okay, now I'm going to go and check what happened out here. I go into the woods. And I get up to it. And here it's the same tree. It's a little tiny maple, little tree that I had just taken the piss by. It was a territorial. I, I pissed on his, apparently, his marking ground. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a territorial confrontation. Mm, that's a lot of piss, my friend. That's a lot of piss going <laughs> on. You pissed off Bigfoot with your piss is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Abs <laughs> that, that's funny <laughs> skeptic yeah. at hashtag spaced out radio on twitter he always asks the same question when it comes to sasquatch conversations we have on this show i think it's a little bit of a fetish because he's wondering if you've ever found any scat samples well i always do but that is very hard to determine. Even if you were to send it in for DNA, the DNA would be so corrupted because of all the other DNA that it's eaten. You know, if it's eaten a mouse, well, now you've got mouse DNA in it. it. Yeah, I found lots of scat out there. and we've, we, When we've been on expeditions, I've collected it in bags and stuff like that and sent it in, but it's always come back in, either inconclusive or uh, contaminated with other hand, animal hair and stuff like that, well, that's understandable. If it's eating other animals, well, then you're going to have that in there. But, yeah, you, you will find it uh, out there. Um, yeah. If someone was looking in the forest for this... What would they be looking for? What would it look like? Describe the deuce of the Sasquatch for us. <laughs> oh, that varies. You know, basically it's all in the diet. If you got one that's uh, raiding, it's all in the season too. You know, in the early spring, you're most likely are going to have parasites in it. Um, if it's got blood in it or anything like that from injury, it's going to be black. If it's going to, if they've been eating berries, it's going to have seeds in it. Um, you, you can't really, really tell what it is, you know, or who may, you know, 
certain unless you're living in the in the woods like I do, you know, I can tell the difference between coyote, fox, wolf, uh, bear, or anything like that. Um, the best way I can say it is a Sasquatch will basically look humanoid. It'll look humanoid. The only bad thing is in certain areas where you have wild boar, it will look something like that too. But uh, it all changes during the seasons or what they've been eating. Uh, injuries or anything like that also contribute to the uh, texture or look of it. But uh, the other, other thing is normal animals will just go as they walk, okay? A Sasquatch has to, just like a human, they have to squat. So if you're looking for it, look for an area of hiding. Um, they won't go next to their bed. So if you find a bed, do a 50-foot circle around there, and you'll find it. Have you ever collected any castings? Yeah. Yep, I did a couple up in uh, Michigan, a couple um, here, and I did one from the Big Phil. What size were they? Uh, one was, the one up in Michigan was, I think, 16 and a half. Uh, Big Phil 18, uh, the one that uh, Kurt found over on the Rock Creek area was, he had a size, I believe, 13 foot, or boot, and this was at least six inches bigger than that, so. Mm -hmm. Do you find that most Sasquatch sightings that you are finding or seeing evidence of are closer to waterways than far into land? Yeah, that's, that's an important, if it's, like I said, physical, in the physical form or anything, water is a major uh, factor. Um, not only a good escape route, but a necessity for the food that they, they like, which are crayfish, clams, anything, you know, you figure, anything that a raccoon would like, the Sasquatch will. Anything a bear will like, the Sasquatch will. Um, they've even disguised their raiding uh, on farm crops to other animals. person gets all their trees broke down in an apple orchard. They blame a bear. Not always. But, yeah, it's very important for the, the water source is the number one uh, then it's basically food concentration is number two. In your area, in your it. in your area of Wisconsin, what are people or what are Sasquatch eating in that area? What is their food source? Every, uh, basically, anything that. Well, I can't say anything that a person will eat out there because I eat stuff out in the woods that no one would eat. Um, well, one of the main sources. The main source is that is globally is rodents. Mice are everywhere. That's a high protein, uh, high energy food. It can they can find it anywhere. They tip over stump. Insects, worms, grubs, um, certain grasses, crops, farm crops. Got that everywhere. Orchards. Then you look at the waterways. You've got clams. You got fish. Then there's in the springtime, you've got young fawns, you've got uh, bird eggs, you've got hatchlings. Um, even in my incidents here with Big Phil, you've got yard cats. Cats and small, small pets, farm animals. Anything easy, they are opportunists. Then you've got, you know, townships and stuff like that, campsites. We had one expedition where I told the guy not to do it, but he did it. He went to a restaurant, and he ordered himself a gigantic pan of pancakes, filled it with syrup. Told him don't do that. 
He did it anyway. He said, I ain't, I ain't worried. Okay, whatever. It's your life. He puts the pan outside. Oh, I was expecting bear. Well, he got something, but it wasn't a bear. It stepped right over his little tent. The entire conversation was over the radios, him screaming and yelling for us to come and help him. Because something was heavy breathing and stepping back and forth over his tent, munching and slapping its lips. First thing I thought was a bear, because a bear will do that. It'll smack its lips when it's eating. But then we found a footprint right there. It was no bear. That's a little too close for comfort. I know researcher Mike Johnson in Colorado he has really, really come to terms with this group of Sasquatch up in the Rocky Mountains. And it's now a game where every time they bring a rookie Sasquatch investigator in to their camp, that person now has to sleep at the back of the tent, which is the furthest away from the door and furthest away from the fire. And Mike will actually tell you that usually sometime in the middle of the night, and it usually doesn't take too long, where all of a the sudden they will have this hand press the tent to get a feel of the person's head or their shoulder <laughs> or something along those lines. And it's now a running joke going on over there because that's what happens. He's built that trust. Oh, it's not a joke. That is frightening as hell when that happens. When something touches you from the outside of a thin little fabric, yeah, you just want to bolt outside the door. That's most likely why they're putting him on the backside, because if he was next to the door, he'd take off running. Absolutely. And on that note, my friend, we're going to hop out for our final break of the night. Our guest tonight, Sasquatch researcher Donald B. Young Jr., his book that I highly suggest you could get on Amazon and elsewhere, Trail of the Sasquatch, A Shaman's Journey. We're going to be talking a little bit more Bigfoot. We're going to get into Dogman because he's in Dogman territory in Wisconsin. And I'm pretty sure he's been looking for the Beast of Bray Road as well. Little people, whatever else is hiding in the forest in the final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. During the break, make sure you check out our website, spacedoutradio.com. We will be back with more SOR and me, Dave Scott, right after this. The SOR Sightlines is a place for you to find answers to your strange experiences. Hi there, this is Mike Schmidt. If you have had an encounter with ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, ETs, or anything else that doesn't make sense, Head to spacedoutradio.com and file a Sightlines report. All information you give is 100% confidential, and I will personally help you find the answers you need. SOR Sightlines. Your answers are a click away. Have you got your Cosmic Passport? If you need one, tune in to Cosmic Passport on Spaced Out Weekend. This is Elizabeth Anglin, ET experiencer, spirit medium, and host of Cosmic Passport. Each weekend, I'll be bringing you interviews and support from other paranormal experiencers and the best in intuitive spiritual guidance from across the globe. It's all happening starting at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, midnight Eastern, on spacedoutradio.com. Hi there. I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with the Four Cop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Wachowski's Strange Days. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit, and expect a miracle. This is your medium, Joanna, from Spaced Out Weekend, Two Mediums and a Large. 
I would love it if you would come and join us with host James Tyson every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. Together, we will take your calls and your questions live. Our goal is to provide you with a positive outlook on deep questions that you may have. Questions regarding love, relationships, money, or whatever else is on your mind. Come and check us out at spacedoutradio.com. This is Eric Markham, news editor for Spaced Out Radio's The Encounter Online. We have put together a great team of writers and journalists from all over the world to bring you top quality paranormal stories from alien encounters to the latest conspiracies, you won't find any of that fake news here. True stories and top-notch reporting as we look to bring these experiences to the mainstream. The Encounter, online, only at spacedoutradio.com. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream. Stories so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. Become more intimate and interactive with Spaced Out Radio. Join our Space Travelers Club with your new membership. For $5 a month, we'll provide you with special access to the website, monthly prize draws from books to psychic readings, along with monthly newsletter, private interviews, and more. Sign up today to be part of Spaced Out Radio's experience. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Don't have time to listen to Spaced Out Radio Live? Wherever you are, the car, the office, the shower, or even if you're traveling, we're right here for you. Each Spaced Out Radio show can be found on iTunes, TuneIn, and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's the perfect way for you to catch up on our shows. For more information, just head over to our website, spacedoutradio.com, and tune in to us today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you'd join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. From Mothman to Frogman and everything in between, hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. Every Saturday and Sunday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and hashtag Spaced Out Radio. And on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Now, back to the program. A child grew up too fast, went running wild. Now we don't know who to pray to. 
Welcome back to the final hour of Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us as we are here seven days a week on the mighty SOR. Tomorrow night on the program, we get into the conspiracy field. We're going back to World War II. Albert Jack will join us. We're going to talk about the conspiracy around musician Glenn Miller, his disappearance. What happened there? We'll find out tomorrow night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. We want to welcome in our terrestrial radio stations, WQEE 99, Rock the Key Down in Noon in Georgia. Good to have you with us. We're also the nighttime show in New Orleans. At W, make that at uh, UPRN, the United Public Radio Network on 107.7 FM in New Orleans. And over 160 countries around the world, great to have you along for the ride as well. We're live in Las Vegas on Renegade Talk Radio, our newest affiliate, KTLK, The Fringe FM. And we're on Revolution Radio as well. Remember, the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Head on over to freedomslips.com and donate today. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Anti-disestablishmentarianism. Anti-disestablishmentarianism is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, Space Travelers, as Bill sets a password each and every night. If you want to follow us on social media, you can be like Marcus. Follow us at hashtag Spaced Out Radio during the show. I'll get to your questions and comments there live. Make sure your snark is good. Also, on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune us in on TuneIn. Download this show and others on iTunes, RadioGuide.fm, TalkStream Live, Player.fm, and Stitcher or other places you can find us. And our website is SpacedOutRadio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including joining the SOR Space Travelers Club for as low as $5 a month. We're talking Bigfoot tonight. Our guest Donald B. Young Jr. You can find his book, Trail of the Sasquatch, A Shaman's Journey, on Amazon. And it's all over the internet. Make sure you check it out. Donald, welcome back for the final hour. Thank you. We've been talking and mainly focusing the first couple of hours on Sasquatch. i got a couple questions before we move on. And this one comes from Ron. He is asking, does Bigfoot use any kind of tools indicating a sign of of intelligence. Well, yeah, just like any uh, uh, primate, and well, in the physical form again, any kind of primate always uses a uh, uh, bunch of different tools. Um, a uh, just a stick, for instance, uh, it can use that for digging, uh, looking into uh, digging up grubs or anything like that. Um, as far as building tools or anything like that, no. It 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 uses the the what the forest will give it. Uh, that's how I can summarize it the easiest. It'll use what it has at hand in the forest. Do you think there will ever come a day when we actually prove the true existence of this creature? It it could be. It, it could be, um, if it's in the physical form, it can be rather soon. Because as we deforest the world, many more animals will show up that we never knew existed. That's happening every, every day. But also, we're going to miss out on a lot of the animals that depend on the forest, and we will basically eradicate them because they don't have a a home anymore. But more sightings will show up as the forests shrink and populations of human expand. Let's move on to some other creatures. You're right in the middle of Wisconsin, near Michigan. And in 1989, Linda Godfrey, who is the queen of the dogman, wrote an article about the Beast of Bray Road. To have Sasquatch in your area, along with numerous dogman sightings, do you believe that both creatures have come in contact with each other, or do you believe that they try and stay out of each other's territory? Uh, I'd say they ran across each other, but they they tend to 
probably, I would have to say they have their own territory. You know, they they avoid each other. Kind of like when you got a wolf pack and a coyote pack. They're both, they know they're there, but unless they come within sight of each other, there's not going to be no problem. In your quest to communicate and connect with Sasquatch, have you ever run across Dogman? I'm not sure. I've I've come across some things out in the woods at night that I haven't seen but have, on one incident, I was treed. And uh, I stayed up at the top of this tree all night long because this thing was at the bottom, growling, snapping, trying to climb up the tree after me. It was too big, so it kept on busting the branches and falling back down. The attack was finally called off by something that yelled or screeched out into the, uh, or down the trail. Um, that was my own stupidity, though. That, I, I had drawn it in. It, it basically followed a scent trail that I was laying because I, I wanted it to go back to my campsite where I had my pickup and a tent with a tape recorder in it of snoring. I wanted to basically have it go to the tent while I was in the back of the truck watching. I didn't make it that far. So I don't know what that was. That could have been a Sasquatch. That could have been a dogman. You know, people have said, oh, it was a bear. It wasn't no bear because uh, there was no claw marks on the, the tree's trunk. And a bear will use its hind legs to push itself up using its claws and uh, will grab around the tree with its front paws and using the claws to climb up and uh, there was no claws at all whatever this was was literally grabbing the branches and its weight was just snapping them right off mm -hmm. so dog man I don't know it could have been one There are a lot of people who say Dogman seems to be quite more ferocious and quite more aggressive than what we see with Sasquatch. Would you, in your research, agree with this? Uh, yes, I would, because uh, the Dogman, if, if like their description... It has the muzzle, the large teeth, uh, a canine, which is a meat eater. So, and it even goes with the one uh, road worker down towards uh, the Milwaukee area who had a deer snatched right out of the back of his truck. Um, a Sasquatch now, in the physical form, would be more like an optimist. It would be out there eating berries, uh, uh, meat when it finds it, roots, grubs, like we went through the, before about its uh, food. A dog man, that, that's totally different. That's, that's a meat eater. It's, yeah, it's going to be very much dangerous. What's the closest you believe that you have come in contact was it when you were treed or do you think that you have been followed like a cougar will stalk it will continually circle you until it gets very very close making that circle smaller and smaller and smaller around you or do you think that this is something that will come straight out and make contact face to face well, i think i think it's gonna just like just like a wolf pack or a coyote pack or a solitary lobo out there will check you out first. It's gonna. I've been paralleled by a Sasquatch already. A young one, a youth, was basically following me. Um, any kind of a predator, uh, unless they're rabid or crazed by something or a wound, they're not going to just rush in and attack you. They're going to parallel you. They're going to watch you. They're going to get... Uh, downwind of you to get a good scent of what you are. They're going to keep an eye on you, make sure you ain't got no weapons, make sure that you can't harm them. 
even in the ocean, a shark is going to circle you a few times before they come in for a strike. So do you feel that there is any fear with Dogman when it comes to people? Because we do see a lot of times Bigfoot will try and get away from people. We don't see Bigfoot or hear a lot of stories of Bigfoot attacking. Yet with Dogman, it seems to be polar opposite. I don't think with the Dogman, I don't think there's no fear. I think there's caution. And, uh, yeah, fear, no. If it came down to it, he's going to, like I just said, he's going to circle you, he's going to parallel you, he ain't going to be afraid of you. He's going to wait until the opportune moment. He's going to come in from behind. You know, I, I don't know. This one time when I was walking down the road, my vehicle had broke down. It was night, and I could hear on the pavement, way in back of me, claws tapping the surface of the uh, pavement. You know, the Something was following me, and boy, did that have the hair. I started singing to myself and everything just so I couldn't hear that. But that is the characteristic of a, a predator. Something was checking me out. Oh, that eerie feeling indeed, Don. Eerie feeling indeed when you were all of a sudden the prey. Mm-hmm, yep. How do and you... I've had that happen with uh, known animals, uh, regular wolf packs out there, coyote packs. When I've when I've wounded a deer during a hunting season or bow season, and I'm out there late at night dragging this deer home, and yeah, all of you shine the light over to the sides, and you got eyes over there watching you, and you hear panting over there. You know you're being followed. They're just waiting for you to either do something wrong, trip and fall, then they're that, then you're susceptible. They're to come and grab your throat. So how does one protect themselves against a creature like that? Do you run? Do you... No, no. Never run. Never run. But uh, I don't know. Uh, against something like that, if you're totally unarmed, you're pretty much done for. <laughs> You're armed. I don't know. It, it it may be a spirit animal, as like I said with the Wendigo. A modern weapon won't take it down. So no matter what you do, unless you can, like a shaman, throw a protective force around that it can't come in, it it'll leave you alone. Um, a lot of times, a medicine bag will have that uh, protective force in it. But uh, as far as battling one head-on to try to protect yourself, that's, that's the only way I can answer that is, can you defend yourself against a cougar? I haven't defended myself against a cougar at a <laughs> bar, let alone in the forest. <laughs> well, you don't have no knife, you don't have no gun or anything like that, and you're out in the woods and cougars after you yeah even if you were to take both thumbs and put it in the thigh it's still going to take you out for sure for sure now when it comes to a lot of these cryptid creatures do you you i know how you feel about sasquatch you feel that it is a shapeshifter that it can jump in and out of reality do you feel the same thing for Dogman as well? I'm not sure. Now, the Dogman may be um, a one, one-time thing. A Dogman may be a spirit, but it also may be a mutation. It may be a shapeshifter. It may be like in the movies of the werewolf. It may be the true shapeshifter where... Like in the movies, the guy is walking along, he looks up at the moon, and he starts turning into it. That may be what the dog man may be. It may be a werewolf. Mm-hmm.
I was actually going to ask you that next, if you thought it was a werewolf, because other investigators tend to think that they are two separate creatures. Okay. Then, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know on that. Um, uh, as far as it goes with the natives, it basically would be the Wendigo. Going on that, the cannibal man, the, the, the cannibal man basically has an appearance. It can go into a wolf appearance. Um, it can go into a big cat appearance, too. It's, it's basically a shapeshifter. Um, but it will, for threat-wise, go into the most frightening. Now, see, and there's another aspect of it. Whatever a person, see, now you had mentioned that about telepath, telepathic with Bigfoot. Well, a shapeshifter would look into the mind of who it's after. What does that person fear most? That's what it would change into. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't that be along the lines of what we see at the Skinwalker Ranch? Yeah, well, exactly, exactly. I've heard about that, and I, I haven't dug into it much. I've only seen the uh, documentary on TV about it. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Is that the next step for you in research, is looking in to see if the Skinwalker has made its way to the Wisconsin area? Oh, I'm pretty sure it has already. Uh, it's it's not like they have borders. <laughs> True enough. Pretty sure it's across the entire United States. It's just someone in Wisconsin was lucky enough a couple times to see one. I have a friend of my of mine here. She was actually traveling one day, and she's First Nations as well, but she lives in the states. And they actually had a skinwalker chasing their vehicle down the road, and it didn't matter how fast they went, they could not lose that skinwalker. Mm. Right. That that's just eerie, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. eerie. You know, and there's there's nothing that you can you can stop if it is a a, a spirit entity. No matter how fast you go, it don't matter. It can just enter your vehicle through energy. You'll be driving along, and now it's right next to you in your seat. Mm Mm-hmm. That I didn't know. That basically, it's using the energy of the spirit world, which means it can pop in wherever it wants. The definition of a skinwalker, wasn't that a shaman that went rogue and malevolent? Yep. yep. Yeah, in the uh, Apache, it would have been a brujo. A witch. Scary times. Scary times indeed. What's a strange... And they, and they basically, and that what that is what it is, they... Uh, a lot of times it's just simple illusion. A lot of times it's a, a magician trick. But like I was saying, it will be a mute, mutation of their selves and the cells for their appearance. Hmm. What's the weirdest thing you've ever seen in the forest? Oh, Sasquatch. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd have to say that. Um, the weirdest thing, yeah. Um, every every other animal out there, when I when I first came across them as a kid, and that was always weird. But uh, as you get older, you get used to them. No matter how many times I encounter uh, a forest dweller or Sasquatch, it's a frightening encounter and no matter what it, it that i would have to say is the most unusual what it's, about 
what about gnomes or little people? Because my audience here, Don, they know gnomes freak the living daylights out of me. Mm-hmm. Okay, they just, they weird me out, don't like them, don't want them to be around, but my audience absolutely tortures me in the chat rooms with pictures of gnomes. Uh-huh. Have you well, ever read the, the Orientals called uh, gnomes, or the little people, gremlins. Um, they always get into mischief. The Native Americans... Uh, also have them, the, the Iroquois call those the little people, or uh, there's a couple other tribal names for them, the uh, prankster. Um, it, it's basically a, uh, I don't, it's not, it, it's not going to look like what you see in the store. You go into a store and there's a little guy with a pointed hat. It's not, it's not going to be that kind of a gnome. These are evil looking little uh, usually hairless, bald creatures with claws and pointy ears. These are not gray skin. There was a woman over towards Kenan Catawba area that I went and investigated. That was several years ago. Kept on telling this one guy that she had to take sandwiches out to these little children out in the woods. The guy thought, well, what, what the hell? They followed her out there. And yeah, sure as oh, sure as yet here, she's putting all these little sandwiches along a log, and then she'd sit down on another log and just start cooing them in, by talking kind. And the guy didn't see anything. The woman walks off, and the guy leaves, he follows her out, and by the time he gets back out there to check it out, all the sandwiches are gone. So I went and checked this out. I never seen anything. But that ain't saying they ain't there. Mm. You know, I've told this story many a times on this show. I'll fill you in. I used to live at a basement suite after my first wife and I split up, and I wanted to live close to my daughter, so I rented a basement suite. And my daughter swore that my landlord's garden gnomes would come tapping at her window at night. Hmm. All right. That's the one that got me going, because my daughter, who is ha- is a a paranormal experiencer, pretty much her entire life, she was you know kind of weirded out by that, and so these gnomes, man, they scare me. Like even right now, I'm reading in the chat rooms. Dave loves gnomes. They're always pranking Dave. You know this, <laughs> Miss Nomer. You know, this is what I get. My audience is cruel to me this way. Cruel! Well, see, now, with the uh, ceramic gnomes or the little gnomes that are in the yard, if they come to action, that's not basically your real uh, forest gnome. That's basically a spirit. A bad spirit has entered its form. So... Mm -hmm. You see an actual one out there in the forest, a little trickster, you're going to know it. I did run into one. Yeah, a little growling, snapping, evil little person about two feet tall, skinny as hell, gray skin, pointy ears, claws, and teeth. It ain't going to look like the friendly little gnome with a pointy hat. Well, it's funny because last year, my son and I, we were walking along a trail in the summer and I had him in his stroller cause he's only three years old. And you know, when you get to that point of the year in my area, you have to be bear aware. And, All right. and well, I just, I just felt it would be safer rather than him walking <clears throat> where in case him and I needed to scramble on out of there that we had a stroller rather than me carrying him. And so anyways, he's in a stroller. We're having a good time. We start walking down this hill and up from the lake side of the path that we were coming, there's a hill going down to the lake. There came this thing, just trotting out into onto the path. And I hate to say it because it sounds so stupid and cartoonish, but A, it was blurry. It's right in front of me, and it's blurry. 
and B, it looked like a <laughs> a a dirty two by four that was only about eighteen inches to two feet tall, with little oh. arms and legs sticking out of it. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me! <laughs> and by the time I looked at it and caught what it was, it's it it was like in mid step, stopped, and took off back into the trees and down that hill. And all, and all I could say to myself was, can you believe that happened? Are you serious right now? Like, I actually saw that? My son didn't see a thing. But it was it's just amazing what can all of a sudden just crawl out of the trees at any time. Yep, yep. See, the, no, I got one video that I had captured. I don't know if you've seen it. You can probably go on my uh, Facebook and see it. It, it, I, I named it Possible Baby Bigfoot with a Thermal. That one's got everyone freaked out, even scientists. It's a little guy sitting next to a tree. Well, he ain't that little. He's four feet tall. As fast as you can imagine, he jumps up into the tree and he's gone. But that's... That could could have been like what you're talking about, one of the little gnomes. I never thought about that. I always thought it was like a baby Bigfoot. I but on the, th- on, on, on the gnome aspect of the only thing I can compare them to, I don't know his name. I forgot what they called him. I'm the Lord of the Rings, that little creature. What was that thing's name? The one ne- that was I, I've c- never seen a Lord of the Rings. Eagle. Schmeagle, I think was his name. It's a little creature that's always trying to get the ring. He calls it precious. That would be your actual forest gnome. Mm. An evil little looking thing. Very unattractive. Very... Uh, yeah. When, I think Eric is saying Gollum? Uh, well, no, Gollum was the one from the Vikings. That one was actually a Bigfoot. Yeah, that one was actually a Bigfoot. That's the one that uh, the famous Viking had to go over and kill. Yeah. Uh, I think it's Smeagol was its name in Lord of the Rings. The absolute torture I am taking right now, and it started on, <laughs> on Twitter now. Thanks, HH. Thanks, John. Appreciate you mentioning the gnomes with the pictures. Appreciate that. <laughs> Dennis, I didn't think you would get in on it either. I expected Ron in Saskatchewan, but that's just ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Every time the damn gnomes come on this show, they hammer me. Freaks me out. Absolutely <laughs> freaks me out. A lot of First Nations up here believe that these little people have their own towns built into mountainsides. A good friend of mine actually had his uncle see one of these, and when his uncle saw the town, he immediately ran down that mountain as fast as he could because it can bring, as you said, tricksters, jokers, a little bit of evil that we would call it too. Why do these little people or these gnomes, whatever you want to call them, seem to have a sinister side to them? Well, it's just it's just their way, apparently. Um, you look at little people, they go through the Napoleon phase. They always got to be rude and mean, acting tough. That could be the thing with these little, little gnomes. They got to act tough. Cause look at them, they're only like two feet tall. Someone can step on them. Well, and when you're that ugly, too, I mean, it must be hard to get a date. <laughs> well, yeah, but to their own, they probably look very handsome or pretty. True that. True that. So besides that, have you ever ran into any of them in the forest? I've ran into tricksters. I haven't seen them, but always got stuff disappearing. Always got stuff getting wrecked. Like out on my bog out there, there's always little tricksters pulling wires out of my 
solar arrays. There's always the solars getting tipped. Oh, yes, this could be bears and other stuff like that. But it's the little stuff. You put a screwdriver somewhere. You walk around collecting firewood. You go back to the project, and the screwdriver's gone. You find it about an hour later outside over on the, a stump or something. That's what they that's what they do. Um, it's just a little. That's why they got the name Prickster. Mm-hmm. The only time they're really uh, harmful to you is, like you said, if you come up to their uh, population or if you uh, pose a threat. But if you're not a threat, they're more or less just a trickster. They'll come and steal stuff from you. You know, kind of like on, uh, uh, let's see, Star Wars, when uh, Luke crashed in that swamp and Yoda was being a little pest. Pretty much like that. They try to steal your candy bar, try to take stuff from you that don't belong to you without you knowing. Curiosity. In your area, then, is there more than just Dogman, Bigfoot, and Little People walking around when it comes to the strange? Oh, yeah. It's not just, it's not just the uh, well-known, you know. There's the ones out there, the other tricksters, which are called the Wichitas. They're out there. They're, um, them are little tiny people as well. There's, well. I don't call them people. They're evil little... Evil little creatures that also are no hair, um, run around causing any kind of havoc they can. Um, spirits like uh, the forest is just filled with spirits. Um, every kind of spirit you can imagine, from uh, spirit animals to dead from a long time ago to present dead. What about the fairy realm? Have you ever found any fairies in the forest? I, I don't know. It, it's With that, I've, I've found orbs. I've caught orbs with my own vision, and I've caught orbs on uh, camera. Um, some people say that those are... Uh, fairies inside it. Uh, some people say that that's uh, extraterrestrial. Um, could be just swamp gas. I don't know. But a lot of times when I've seen it, there weren't no swamps. I was on high ground in Michigan. And all these little green and red orbs were everywhere. And then right after that, we had a Sasquatch sighting. And then the orbs were gone. Let's get to some questions from our audience they are building up here. Don wants to know, do you think Bigfoot could be a ghost? Could be. I, well, that is basically from the spirit world. As I, as I had mentioned long ago, thousands of years ago, the Sasquatches most likely were physical beings that walked, walked the earth. They were either exterminated by man or some other, like a disease or something, and now they miss their past physical form, so they come back from the, the spirit world. So yeah, in a, in a sense, like a ghost. Follow-up question from Don. Do you believe that fairies are malevolent little creatures or that they're nice to be around? Maybe hang out, come over for tea. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I've I am not really experienced in them, but from what I've uh, heard from uh, native elders, they're evil. Yeah, they're evil. They will when you sleep at night in your tent or your teepee. They will come to your uh, bedroll and suck the breath out of you. Well, that's not pleasant. No. <laughs> not pleasant at all. 
Eric is asking, are there ways to appease the little people so that they leave you alone? Offerings. Everything, even the living, likes free stuff. Anything that they can use. One, uh, uh, the president of the BFRO, he was real nervous. I used to always carry a hatchet with me. And when I went to bed at night, I always stuck the hatchet in a tree. And he got real nervous about that. Well, I can see why, you know, basically. If the Sasquatch is smart enough, here's a tool, grab it. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. Craig and Lisa are asking the same question. Have you ever seen or come in contact in the forest with any UFOs or extraterrestrials? Well, my ma, grandmother said that I don't remember it. But I remember her telling me stories about it as I woke up a few times with a bad dream that something had taken me away. But uh, I don't remember it. I just remember that she was telling me about about it. And uh, she had to take me in to a doctor just to see if there was something wrong with me. I was only like five years old at that time doctor couldn't find anything wrong but uh yeah I've, I've seen stuff that's flying up in the sky that just doesn't have any jet sound or anything like that um as far as uh, an alien appearing to me no um i do believe they exist we cannot be the only intelligent life in the universe um all the way from Australia, Stephen is asking, why is it that some people see these things more than others, even if they live in the same area? Have you ever thought about that? Yeah, it, it goes with the belief. Certain people are chosen. Uh, if you're meant to see one, you're going to. Um, if you're not, you're not. Um, like I, like I uh, had said with, with the hunting, Animals will, the animal spirit will give itself to you. If it thinks you are in need, uh, it'll give its flesh body to you. Uh, a Sasquatch or a spirit will manifest itself so it appears to you. It'll give you that gift of sight. That's what happened to me as a young child. I was given the gift. So whenever I go in, not whenever I go into the woods, but many times when I go into the woods, I will encounter them. And at a, at, at a time in my life, it was an annoyance. Because when I was younger and didn't understand it, it was frightening. It was taking my pleasure away from me. My pleasure and my life is the forest. Going in there and seeing something that no one else believes or has seen or has an explanation for is not what I want. So at, in time, as Ben started to instruct me, I started to understand that it was part of my being. My, I was chosen. Question from Eric. He is asking, could the fairies and the little people tricksters be something different, or are they the same thing? I'm not sure. I, I know the trickster isn't like, it's not like little tiny orbs. The tricksters are, from legend, anywhere from two to three feet tall, very skinny, Nasty. Uh, fairies, from legend, are either the ones that people think are nice with little wings and flying around like moths or butterflies, or orbs. But uh, the ones that come to you at night and suck your breath away those are basically miniature versions 
of the little tricksters. You know, you're talking something that's only three inches tall, a little scaly reptilian thing. You know, so that that's not very nice. <laughs> as far as related, I don't know. Could be. Teresa wants to know if you've ever dealt with any sea creatures. Only the ones that I caught on a fishing pole. <laughs> no, I haven't. Um, I've looked into them before and stuff like that. Um, I've researched Loch Ness, um, uh, Lake Champlain. I've researched it. I haven't gone there and done any in-depth research. I've uh, done dives in waters around here. Uh, some of the waters I will never dive in again, like one of them that's out on the bog. It's a circle, and the water plumes out of it because it's a natural spring. Literally, I had a mask on and goggles, and, or a goggles, and dove down in there and had a rope attached. I'll never do that again. That, I mean, that's... I don't know if it's roots or what, but when you get down there, anything that touches you, that's very frightening. So, yeah. no, I haven't uh, come across any kind of unknown uh, creatures of the water. Most of the stuff that I've come across is uh, known to me. Let's get to another question from Lindsay, who is asking, have you ever seen any of those six-inch little people like Stephen Greer seems to have a skeleton of? No, no, no. It, basically, that would be on the lines of the, the little tricksters or the fairies. But, uh, no, I'm, I'm, you know, it, it's it's hard to hard to say. When you get stuff that's constant and i blame that a lot of times on the on the ghosts and spirits i'll even threaten them you know i'm in a i'm in a bad mood or something i'm out there working on something in the shop i'll set down a wrench or something and i'll go over and look for it and it's gone i'll literally start threatening the ghosts i'll say i'm gonna get rid of you all if you don't put it back but that could be these little people doing that and, you know, after a good threat, a little bit of sage, a little bit of uh, some herbs around there, it's amazing how quickly stuff comes back. You let the, if you let the ghost spirits, little people, have their fun, and you know, let, them, let them know who's boss, and everything will be all right. Do you find, though, that protecting yourself from the elements of the spirit because everything does have a spirit, that you find yourself saging quite a bit to make sure you're not taking anything home? Oh, yeah, definitely. Every every time I go in the woods, I'm either dropping tobacco, burning, burning sage, uh, burning some cedar out there. Um, I will ne whenever I'm healing someone, because a lot of times... The illness is spirit. They've got a bad spirit in them. I won't allow anyone that comes here for my healing to come in my house. They can go into my store. That way, it doesn't. they don't leave any traces of a bad spirit in my house that can harm my wife, harm my animals, or linger. If it's out in a store, I can handle it. I'll, I'll just sit out there with it. Have you ever come across any weird or strange actions around your horses? Because we've had a few people who listen to this show say they've actually went and checked on their horses and seen braids put in their mane that were not hmm. human-made. No, no, I haven't uh, heard anything. I, I have had two horses in the back past, but nothing really strange has happened to them. I noticed they were really good watchdogs. If anything come around, the horses always knew. But no, nothing ever happened with them. 
the uh, there was one person south south of me I had gone and investigated. She said that the uh, uh, one of the horses came back and all the hair was missing on its tail except for the the tail itself. Interesting. She couldn't figure out what had happened there. We I couldn't ha- figure it out either. We have three listeners, one in Toronto, uh, near on Toronto, Ontario, mm-hmm. one who is living in Colorado, and the other one on the California-Nevada border. All three have had manes braided on their horses. Mm. Yeah. The only thing I can say that would be doing that is a trickster. Because to the natives, even though the horse was not native to the Americas, that was brought in by the Spanish, um, the natives believed that the horse had a connection. It had a connection to the spirit world. So a trickster basically would have a connection with it. Um, it would be like a friend to him. So... Unless the horse is getting injured, I'd say there's nothing to worry about. Let's move on to another question here. And this one comes from Craig. He's saying, in Native American beliefs, do you have stories of anything being taken from someone personally? Like, do you have any evidence of that happening? Um, yeah, there's quite, there's quite a few, actually, countless stories of, uh, things being taken, and then they'll call in a shaman. I've had to do it myself. Recently, I had to go up to Ashland County. These people, uh, called me up, and, uh, but that wasn't something taken. It was something that I found there that basically stopped the possession but, uh, yeah, things have been taken from people. Uh, a lot of times when that happens, it's a brujo or a witch, a warlock or something like that doing it. Because if they have a possession of yours, uh, then they can cause some real harm to you. Especially uh, anything with your personal, like uh, hair fingernails, anything like that. They can get that out of a hairbrush. Anything that's an heirloom, like an old uh, oh, old jewelry, stuff like that. Because now they can call upon an uh, ancestor of yours. And because they have that, now they own that ancestor. And they can make That answer, even though that ancestor loved you, that ancestor now can turn evil until they release him. Question from Everett. He is asking, if cryptids can manifest or travel or manifest anywhere they want, why are different species so localized and not necessarily seen worldwide? I'll say that again. Well, just in regards to earlier, you said in the program that any type of cryptid, like Bigfoot, could manifest anywhere, in a city, in a forest. And why do they seem so localized to their areas and not necessarily seen worldwide? Well, they are pretty much seen worldwide. Um, It's just in populated areas, they're seen more. What it is, is like when they're coming back from the spirit world, they're going to manifest in an area that they used to live in. Um, In the Americas here, we're heavily populated. So when they come back, if you're meant to see them, you're going to see them. Uh, In places like South America, where they still have massive forests and jungles, where you're not going to see them as, as often. Um, open areas, like in Australia, um, like in the, the desert region, you're going to see the Yowies out there, or you get them into the wetlands or 
the jungles. Um, it's all, they're pretty much everywhere. It's just if you're meant to see them or not. Are you a big fan of the paranormal? Oh, yeah. I have to be, being a shaman. I wouldn't say fan of it. I deal with it. <laughs> True. True. In your estimation, with spirits that are out there, especially coming from a First Nations background, are most spirits quite benevolent in your belief? Uh, the meaning of benevolent, I'm not... Good. Very good. Oh, no. No, they are uh, <clears throat> mischievous. All of them are mischievous. Uh, some of them are bad, but all of them are mischievous. They're... <clears throat> Uh, the majority of them are playful, but their play is mischievous. They do what the tricksters do. They'll come in and they'll move stuff. They won't take it. They'll just move it. They'll walk up to a counter and knock it off of the counter. Now, you just set it on the counter. You're looking all over for it. You don't think they'll look over on the other side or between two cabinets. Um... They'll do stuff electronically. They'll mess with your electronic equipment. Um, but no, as far as evil ones go, those are either people that were very bad in their physical life or you're dealing with demons. Mm -hmm. Have you come across the darker side quite often? Oh, yeah. A lot of people that come to me because they are sick, it will be uh, either demons or it will be bad uh, spirits. Uh, as of lately, that was uh, about a year ago, I had a woman contact me. She was crying on the phone. She was native. She kept on crying. I finally calmed her down, and she was saying that she had such pain in her uh, lower legs and ankles, she could barely walk at work. She went to a doctor, and the doctor gave her pills that didn't work at all. So I asked her, have you ever walked across the grave or anything like that? She goes, no. I go, have you ever gone to a burial ground of natives? And she goes, well, yeah, I've, I've been to the mounds. I said to her, okay, when you were at the mounds, have you ever come across a circle of dead grass? And did you walk across it? She goes, yeah. How, how could you know that? And I go, on these mounds, when they've made them, outcasts or bad witches were never put in the mounds or by the mounds. They were set off to the side and buried or burned. You stepped on one of them, and you walked through it, but before his entire spirit or ghost could get into your body, just a little bit of it did, and that's what's affecting your legs. So she starts crying again. She comes out to my place. I took her out to the bog, and I told her what you have to do is connect your feet with the earth and put the ghost back, put the spirit back. By the time she was done walking out there on the moss, all the pain was gone. And today, she still gets a hold of me. She has absolutely no pain. The spirit is gone. It returned to its grave. So, yeah. We got about 30 seconds left with you, my friend. I would love it if you took a little bit of time here to discuss where people, once again, can find your book. Okay. Well, the main website for the book is http um, colon forward slash slash trail dash of dash the dash sasquatch dot webs dot com. An easier way is to just do the http colon slash slash replures 
dot webs dot com that's r e p l u r e s dot webs dot com and on that website you can you'll see my book a picture of my book just click on that and that'll take you to the main book website from there it'll give you the order page and on the order page it'll give you different uh, retailers the one I would prefer or recommend people to order from would be the publisher himself that way you ain't going through any middlemen and that's author house or they can just go to Amazon they can order the paper book or they can order the Kindle version and it's at Amazon and for there all you'd have to do is either type in my name at Amazon or type in Trail of the Sasquatch a Shaman's Journey and it'll pop up. Excellent my friend. Thank you for being on Spaced Out Radio tonight. I'm going to get you to hold on cuz I got to wrap this thing up. Tomorrow night on the program, Albert Jack is going to join us. We're getting into the Glenn Miller Conspiracy. We're going back in time to World War II. I hope you join us, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time, right here at spacedoutradio.com. Mr. Bumblefoot is about to take us home. Have a great night, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. Remember, we own the night. Own it with us. Mr. B, take us home. (laughs) 